You're listening to the No Labels, No Limits podcast with best-selling author Sarah Box, where you get the inside scoop on the steps action takers and decision makers take to align their purpose to their principles and achieve their goals in business and life. We focus on the mantra, no labels, no limits, no excuses. And now, without further ado, please welcome your commanding coach with plenty of chutzpah and heart, Sarah Box. Hi, welcome back. This is Sarah, your host of the No Labels, No Limits podcast, a podcast all about busting through our limiting labels and beliefs um, and the inner dialogues that we tell ourselves that do nothing but stall us out, make us have self-doubt, and often derail our goals and dreams, which are probably closer than we think. So today's guest, I'm really excited By the time you're listening to this, you may have already met her on a panel that we did for the 300th episode, which was a little different focus, um, but you will recognize her engaged and energetic personality. And if you haven't yet listened to that, let me tell you a little bit about our guest today. Her name is Alice Draper. Right now, she's in Cape Town, South Africa. I've got the edge on her. It's morning for me and evening for her. Same day, though. And... um, (laughs) Alice is a podcast publicist, and she's on a mission to make publicity easy and accessible for underrepresented women entrepreneurs at all stages of their business. That's going to tie into something we talk about in a little bit. Um, When Alice first started building her business, though, she knew that publicity in the right places would garner her the authority she needed to position herself as a high-end copywriter. And so she started pitching magazines like Vice, Refinery29, Huffington Post, Business Insider. And that came with an unplanned skill, the heart, the art. And I would say the heart, the art and the heart of the pitch, um, which is actually how she ended up pitching us and pivoting her business towards publicity. She did a really good job, I'd have to say. And when we get to that part of the interview, I'm going to share back with Alice what's Step stood out for me or struck me from reading her pitch. Um, but she's been running Hustling Writers for over two years. And in this time, she has secured her clients over 500 podcasts, including countless top 1% and top 0.5% podcasts. So that's a high metric. And when Alice isn't building out her publicity strategies or thinking of her new story angles, she's taking advantage of the life she set up for herself, which is location independence. And she house sits with her partners in places like Tbilisi, Nairobi, or Cape Town, which, like I said, is where we find Alice today. Um, I'm going to actually ask Alice to share more about a pet peeve she has has and why, Um, how she learned to overcome rejection. Think about all those pitches. Those didn't all come with yeses. And how for those of you who want to guest on a podcast, I'm going to ask her to share a couple of her proven steps for getting invitations and accept. So with that, let's formally welcome Alice Draper back to the No Labels, No Limits podcast, this time for a solo conversation. Hi, Alice. Hey, Sarah. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for that wonderful and very comprehensive introduction. Well, <laughs> I want Penny people to hearing know who myself back. <laughs> I'm like, oh. <laughs> Well, um, I do. I liked um, your your pitch to the podcast. And I'm going to tell our listeners, we get a lot of people saying, hey, this would be a great guest or I'm a great guest. And um, I would say that Alice paid attention and spoke to things that stood out. So Alice, which was ended up being one of her pet peeves, not about <laughs> us. <laughs> but about what she shared <laughs> with me. But um, oh, my goodness gracious. But Alice, let's just jump right in. And I'm going to share a quote with our audience. And then I want you to talk about why that's a pet peeve for you. So um, Mm -hmm. you sent me this quote from a previous podcast guest. And and this was, if you haven't hit six figures in the first year, you're failing and then comparing. So that was one of the things that a previous guest, Joy Bantra, said was an issue for folks. But and you said that was such a great episode and a pet peeve for you. Why is that, Alice? Mm-hmm. Well, 
I mean, we just, we had a pre-conversation on this, and I think that we often find ourselves unknowingly attaching um, our goals to obscure metrics. And the six figures just totally hit home for me because I know when I started my business, I was, that was the buzzword. That was the word that kind of everyone was talking about. And um, so I kind of found myself working towards that. And I hit, when I remember when I hit my first six figure month, I was working like (laughs) 16 hour days. Um, I felt like everything was all over the place, not streamlined at all. We totally took on too much work, said yes to too many things. And like I, when I kind of sat back from that, I was like, that's not what I want my business to look like. That's not what makes me happy. And six figures was a completely obscure metric for me at the time. I didn't need that much money coming into the business, especially because I was like, I think a couple of months in. Um, and so yeah i think it applies to so many things but when we're just setting a goal and not that there is anything wrong with six figures and like you know i've heard entrepreneurs and freelancers talk about why six figures is a necessity every month and that's because like they're paying off student debt and um paying off certain things and if you're scaling your business and you're scaling your impact and the money sort of needs to represent that impact that you're making, then that makes sense. But if you're just kind of setting these obscure goals that are set for you almost by other people, because this is what other business owners aim for and therefore you are, um, that may not be the right thing for you to focus on. And um, it can be disheartening when you don't hit it, or it can, or you can hit it and be like, oh, actually, Maybe this isn't <laughs> this isn't everything I wanted. <laughs> um, so I think it needs to be kind of anchored in our own personal kind of values and what we're hoping to feel and achieve and what difference we're hoping to make or or a lifestyle you want to live, like paying off debt or having a bigger house or being able to travel. But um, yeah, I think that's definitely a pet peeve. It's just sort of setting these goals without having any real anchor on why you're setting those goals. So let me come, excuse me, let me come back then and think before you started Hustling Writers and you had this vision Mm -hmm. of starting Hustling Writers, did you have a sense of what success for you would look like at that point? Mm, That's a good question. Um, So my vision was stability early on. Um, I didn't have the mission of making publicity easy and accessible. And that was kind of an important thing for me to find when I realized that money wasn't motivating me anymore. You need to have something else anchored in. But early on, money was a motivation and stability was a motivation. So my vision was I want three anchor clients who I have every month who pay me a certain amount of money. And because I was freelancing with like a lot of sort of um, once off assignments or journalism assignments and like publications can take three months to pay you so you couldn't really rely on that to pay your rent you don't know when like it's a way for it to be published and then you invoice <laughs> so my vision was I want three anchor clients clients are paying me every month and you know I achieved that and then and then I kind of started working towards money but I had no real, real reasoning and I think I needed to do some inner work and kind of figure out okay, what what impact do I want to make? What kind of business do I want to grow? Um, I don't think that just setting a goal of money was, um, yeah, <laughs> enough to kind of keep it going. So, well, and that's a thing about like, if it doesn't resonate with you when you said to keep it going, right? It's mm. hard to keep going when you don't feel personally invested. And so mm. stability and finances are not a wrong reason at all. Mm-hmm. Right. That's a good that's a reason a lot of people start businesses. I need some stability. I want to be able to count on something, but they're not enough of a reason when you're really grinding it out to go, this is worth it. Right. Because as you pointed out, you end up you were ending up doing these 16 hour days and what's left of Alice at the end of 16 hours. You got to go to bed so you can get up and grind some more. Right. And I can't help but think that a little bit of you diminishes over time because you're not fully rested. Your ideas aren't fully fresh again, right? You haven't Mm -hmm. been able to step away because you've got to keep pushing. Did you experience any of that? 
Yeah, because I mean, as a business owner, and I'm sure you can relate to this, like your the the joy is like kind of your the, your innovation, the way you kind of adapt strategies, ideas, implement them, the impact you're making, brainstorming new ways to create impact. And if you're stuck in what um, one of my clients described as a delivery trap, which is where you are just focused on meeting the demands of your clients, you can't really think about the things that make you really excited about your business. Um, you know, there is something great about meeting your clients' demands, but not when you're that's all you're doing. And that's you just kind of, you can't even think big picture what strategies would help improve the ROI here, um, or the, the return on investment, or, um, you know, what creative ideas can, can, can I come up with? Or how can I think out of the box? And I think if, um, at least for me, but I think for many people, if you kind of continue on that train of just being in that delivery trap, working really long hours, just delivering your client's demands, it's going to affect the sustainability of the business, like not even just affect you, but kind of how do you sustainably grow your business when um, you're being burnt to the bone? <laughs> well, and you talked about the the fun of innovation, you know, and that mm. I can absolutely relate to that. You know, I'm doing a project. It's it's a new area for me to be working in. So my co-partner in the project, super experienced. I know the mm -hmm. um, business side of the project really well, and I can communicate in both languages, right? Client, mm -hmm. and I'm learning his language, which is really fun because when I was little, I wanted to be like an interpreter. So I'm thinking, well, it's still English, but it's, it's concepts, right? From one yeah. profession to another. And I could see the gap. I'm going, they need it to look like this because they live in this world, right? So mm -hmm. yesterday, I just sent over a thing. I said, would it be okay with you if I took your production and I put it into a playbook, you know, because mm. I knew it would help the client. I sent it back and he goes, this is great. And I'm thinking, because I did it to help me because I think like mm -hmm. them and I'm learning to think like you. And I'm going, that was fun. But I had time to do that. I, in, you mm. know, it, I thought I've got an hour. I can do this, send it back. Would we use it? But you're right. It's like, how could I improve the ROI for that particular group and the one after them and the one after them? But if it had been in that constant, okay, I've got to do this, I have to edit, blah, blah, blah. I wouldn't have had the time I'd been focused on only getting it out the door. And yeah, so I think you're so right in that. So how did you make that shift though? Did you have help or coaching or did you do anything to rethink it? Or was it more retrospective on your introspective on your part? I love that you spoke about your example as well. And um, so I think it speaks to as well. And um, I think I have an advantage, which is that I work with coaches, like I do the PR for coaches. So I have a lot of their philosophies and ideas and, um, kind of, <laughs> you know, the stuff they create in my head where I'm like, okay, this isn't working. I need to free up some space. And so, um, I'm lucky I have a team. Um, so I have help with research, with sending out emails and with um, writing, um, pictures. Um, I have a team of three contractors. And what kind of derailed me that month is that I said yes to ad hoc projects from clients. So there is podcast publicity and there's some publication publicity and two clients wanted help with sponsorship pitches and guest pitches. And I just realized like one sponsorship pitch is totally out of my wheelhouse and it's a whole new thing. And I shouldn't have said yes because I couldn't get the same results because I hadn't done the research and I didn't even have time to do the research so my that that month that me taught me kind of don't say no I mean don't say yes to things unless they really excite you and this is something you think you can learn and you know obviously I was honest with the client I said so I hadn't done this before but she kind of assumed well you pitch and it's the same thing and you'll get the same results and um so yeah that was really stressful so I think my takeaway was like don't say yes to new things unless they really light you up and also like really manage expectations. Um, and I think the second thing was, um, yeah, just kind of capping my growth so that I have, I feel like I'm coming from a place of like lots of resources and not from scarcity of resources. Um, and so I've been very intentional about, you know, not 
not bringing on lots of clients when I feel like I kind of understood like this is this is a comfortable number of clients and maybe there's other ways I can grow other ways I can serve clients um yeah so I think those are the, the big kind of things and I didn't have any coaching but I guess I had some indirect coaching <laughs> Well, I, we do learn from our environment and from things we listen mm. to and books we read and all of that. Um, I just didn't know if someone said, Alice, let's <laughs> get you squared up here. Um, but one more thing on that topic before we go, what was your biggest takeaway? Like if someone was going to start a business and they're the Alice mm. of two years ago and you were and mm. your friends, they've given you permission, permission to share your experience. You're not just <laughs> steamrolling them. Um, what would be one thing you'd say, hey, I just would like to offer you this piece of suggestion before you get going? What would that to be? To myself, to you, the girl? To, the, to you or to someone who came to you and said, I love what you did over the last few years. I want to do something similar. What would you tell me? Mm, mm, that's a good question. I would say don't be afraid of leaning into change and in unknown. And um, this is a tricky one. So say like, don't be afraid of investing in your business in the sense of like kind of group coaching. But like I work in the coaching space and I think that there are a lot of wrong decisions people can make when it comes to investing in coaches. Not every program is a fit, not every coach is a fit. And there are a lot of coaches who may not be very good at what they do um, because it's an un unregulated space. So like, be discerning, do your research, speak to past clients, <laughs> make sure that this is a coach who can help you and not one who's kind of teaching you to teach other people what they do. Um, yeah, so just be discerning, do your research, but don't be afraid to invest in your business because I think it's funny, like I work with coaches, but I think I was afraid to invest in my business and um, I, I was, you know, I mean, it's not... I think it's good to be stable, but I kind of looked at the end of last year, December, and this is different, like off, off topic to what we were speaking about earlier. When I looked back towards the end of last year, I kind of felt like 2022 was a fairly stagnant year for me. Nothing changed dramatically from 2021. And I realized, like, you know, I, this year, having worked with the coach and kind of building out my new offer, is that I need accountability, I need support, and I need smart people telling me, kind of <laughs> directing me to the right place. And um, and also kind of holding your hand to take a risk because changing a business is a risk. It doesn't feel too risky in the beginning if you are not risking a lot, like a really successful career. And I wasn't risking a lot. I was coming in as a freelancer. And so starting a business doesn't feel risky because no one knows about it. And if you your idea flops, who cares? But when you've been in business for a while, pivoting your business or adding new offers or changing things up feels like a huge risk because what if everyone thinks that's stupid? And like, why are you doing things differently to how you've always done them? Um, so I think community and coaching and smart people just hold my hand and say, actually, this is a good idea and you should go forward, go through with it. And that's where you get, you grow and you innovate. Um, so yeah, I think if I could go back in time, I'd be like, don't be scared to make investments, <laughs> but also be discerning. Don't just throw your money anywhere. Um, so yeah, I think that's what I I'd second say. both of those. <laughs> you know, because there's that whole yeah. tendency to want to be really frugal. And then people say, well, why don't mm -hmm. you have someone? Oh, I don't know if I can, I can afford that. And I'm thinking, maybe the question is, I'm not sure I can't afford that, right? Like it's a must yeah. do. Um, yeah, exactly. But once you, you get can lose a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like going, why would I do? So that's one of the questions I ask myself. How can this task or this project be made better and easy mm. and easier for the mm. client and easier for our team? And oftentimes that means outsourcing, even a tiny piece of it, right? Or getting an expert mm. in for 35, 50 minutes to say, hey, just tweak it here. You got it, you know? But it's mm. that fear of mm. like wanting to be the person or the desire rather, like, you know, it all. We don't. Truth be yeah. told, no one does. And now we're so connected. It's easy to reach out to people and say, can I ask a question? Can I pay you? Mm. I just did that this week. I saw someone in one of my groups. 
the shared, you know, peer group. Yeah. And she posted something. I went, oh, my God, I would love to be able to have that because I'm doing a workshop mm -hmm. on that topic and I'm getting ready to do all my materials. Right. So I, mm -hmm. I text her. I said, but I could I have the editable. Would you be open? Because she said this is just a beta for her. And I said, would you be open to sharing an editable version of that with me? That's not easy to say, Alice. Um, yeah. And I'm happy to pay you for it. But when we modify it, I'm also happy to give that back to you so you can further edit however you want. No restriction. And she goes, no, here you can have it. And if you feel like compensating me something, that's great. Well, of course, I compensated her because she's starting a business. I'm thinking every entrepreneur <laughs> needs support. Yeah, right? needs some common. Well, she did great work. And I'm going, yeah. cool, now I can modify. I can add in things since we're already working on it on the back end. But it was just that thing like 10 minutes asking for help. Mm. They made probably 10 hours of effort plus having to frame it out and explain what I wanted. So I just think to your point, like ask for help. And, and also being in a group does help you be accountable. Now mm -hmm. you specifically shared with me in your pitch that overcoming rejection mindset, mindset and those blocks through community and community support and gamifying really helped for you. Could you share a bit about that? Cause I know you had a lot of rejection in the beginning. <laughs> Nothing personal. Yeah. But you, you <laughs> no, no, the this fire. Is, this is part and parcel of answering the pitching game. You're going to get rejected. It's not personal. <laughs> um, but I love just to your point about asking, um, asking for help. I love that. And I think that, you know, there's, I just want to speak on that quickly. Like the fact that we can just approach anyone is something I think we should take advantage of in a respectful way. Um, and so I, I know I posted on LinkedIn earlier this year about asking my clients for advice on raising, raising my rates. And they gave me suggestions that was really helpful in terms of new offers and stuff. And I wrote a LinkedIn post and someone asked me and, and you know, I told her kind of how I approached this because she was wondering if she could do something similar with their clients. And I think we kind of forget that we can just message people about these things. But a lot of the time people are open, especially if it's something very specific to something you've shared. Um, but yeah, so on to rejections. Um, well, if you enter the freelance journalism space, you're going to get rejected. <laughs> That's kind of the first piece of advice I got. And it's the first piece of advice I tell people. And it's, if you want to make it, if you want to get published, you need to change your relationship with rejections because um, rejections suck. But I know when I first started pitching myself, I was quite emotionally attached to the outcome of the pitch. And so I would, you know, find this perfect publication and have this perfect idea. And I envisioned it in this publication. I envisioned like my byline and the like logos of the publication and the story being executed. I envisioned myself sharing it. And that's all like really great in terms of being inspired to create something. But um, I, when the rejection came in, I took that as a personal offense. That was like, oh my gosh, I am not wanted by this place that I thought I was perfect for. It's, you know, like going on a really promising date with someone and all your values align and they make you laugh and you get vulnerable and they get vulnerable and then they ghost you. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I just thought this was, there was potential here. And um, I think like changing your relationship with that is that there are so many reasons why you're getting rejected that have nothing to do with you. And it's the same with dating, right? Like, that person is maybe not emotionally available right now because they just came out of a breakup or or there is a lack of value alignment and that's not something you can control um and the same with pitching publications is that editors may have they may have any budget to assign stories on you know the bank crisis right now or um whatever you know they may be like okay we we have budget for five more stories and two of them need to be personal finance related and three need to be this related or um, like there are a myriad of reasons why an editor is rejecting you. Maybe your pitch 
isn't great and that's like <laughs> to improve the pitch <laughs> um but it's not personal and um my the only way where i could really commit to actually getting my bylines and big publications was to almost depersonalize the pitch process um and that came through setting rejection goals um and i give credit to a facebook group which is um it's like a secret network of Facebook groups that you can't disclose publicly, but it's all women writers, um, women and non-binary writers. So you can message me if you want to join them. Um, but yeah, anyway, they had a Facebook group called something of full of rejects. And in that Facebook group, people would set rejection goals. And there was an article about like the power of setting 100 rejection goals. And I remember seeing journalists were like, 15 years more experience than me being like, I'm so excited. I just got rejected from the Paris review or I'm so excited. I just got this rejection from um, the Huffington Post or Al Jazeera or something. And I think that really encouraged me because I was like, wow, like this is normal. It was like these successful journalists who've been in this, in this field for decades are still getting rejected and they're kind of talking about it and sharing it. So I think in that way, community was everything to kind of help me depersonalize it. Because so I was like, oh, it's not just me. This is normal. This is this is kind of part and parcel. And I remember um, also like seasoned journalists being like, how to break into a, a big publication and was like just persistently pitch them. Like when someone rejects you, that's a door left half open. That means they're welcoming you to pitch them again. <laughs> um, and yes, yeah, so I set my rejection goals and I think I got like 67 rejections the first time. And I got some, some of my first bylines. And um, then the following year, I got into the Huffington Post and Vice and I think the following year was Refinery29 and at this point I'd kind of diversified my income stream so journalism wasn't the only thing I was doing but it was still like you know as a copywriter I want I want the big bylines I, and I love journalism it's just not very stable um and then I as I transitioned to publicity I kind of applied a similar logic to other forms of pitching like podcasting is that there are so many uncontrollable variables um and also like value alignment is another uncontrollable variable. You can't always predict whether your values perfectly align with the host. And um, you just kind of have to depersonalize that process and kind of look at it as like a step forward. I'm putting myself out there and that's, that's a good thing. <laughs> um, yeah, so I guess that's kind of my story. Of well, you pointed out a couple of really great things about that is you had your rejection goals, which meant that you're still pitching regardless of outcome. You're not taking a, it's mm -hmm. not like, oh, they hate me. It's just like, I'm not a fit yet, right? You may be yeah. sometime, you may not be, given things that are mm -hmm. not in your control. I will say when we get pitched, um, the things that annoy me, and I mean, I don't even, I don't make the final decisions anymore on our podcast. Mm -hmm. Yes, Summer and I, my online business manager and I are in alignment. She knows what mm -hmm. fits because as a team, we've decided our editorial quote unquote content for the year. We haven't created mm -hmm. it, but we have a theme mm -hmm. or a focus, right? It's mm -hmm. not personal if you're not in the focus. You know, it's just like, yeah. we're not going there right now. But when people keep going, have you, did you see my last email? We're waiting on a reply. I'm thinking, do you think you're the only person in my life asking us for yeah. a response? And by the way, I have many yeah. clients who really want help. So I'm going, okay, that, I know it's important to you, but mm -hmm. you're not the only person on the planet pitching us. So mm -hmm. give me a tip on how you help your clients who are trying to learn to pitch, um, how to approach, you know, some actionable steps about uh, pitching someone, either someone else or themselves on a podcast, what are some actionable approaches that you find work? Mm, that's a great question. Um, I think the first thing is uh, you want to be pitching the right places, right? So um, what I think is an easy way to kind of get started to finding those places is look at people who speak to your target audience that have you know, I'd say, I always say like two or three or four steps ahead of you. So if you are um, kind of 
been in business for one year and you have like 800 LinkedIn followers, maybe you want to look at someone who has been in business for longer and um, has maybe like five times your platform. Um, you don't want to look at someone with a huge platform because that's not going to be easy to <laughs> replicate. Um, and then put their name into Apple Podcasts and you will see the places they have been on. And that kind of gets you a good idea of the types of shows that one take guests in your zone and two, um, yeah, that actually take guests and then you have to speak to your target audience. Um, so I think that's kind of the first step towards finding so research and also pitch research and pitch the shows you listen to because you know those shows. The yep. same with pitching publications, pitch the publications you read because you know them, you know their voice, you know what they want. Um, and then, yeah, what what other tips would I give here? Well, let's stick um, into that for just a second. You know them, mm -hmm. right? You know them because you're part of their community. Right. Whether you're whether they know you are or not. Right. You're listening to them. Mm -hmm. You're reading them. Um, so you've already invested in them at some level. Yeah. You know them. Right. That's a big yeah. deal. And I think it's becoming more and more a big deal anymore, Alice, mm -hmm. because it's like, why would I invest in you when it's so transactional? It's not a yeah. relationship. Yeah. It's nothing um, that I'm sure you want to benefit the people I'm trying to support. It's just all mm -hmm. about you. So mm -hmm. I think those two points are really important, right? Do your research, but invest some time in learning about them. Or like you said, go to what you listen to and are familiar with um, because mm -hmm. you can speak to that audience. And I think we forget it's like, well, this is a fit because we think whoever we are current audiences think it's important. You should hear about it. And honestly, there's people who are going, doesn't matter to me. Yeah. Not that yeah, they don't like exactly. it, it just doesn't resonate. You know, and by the way, do you even know, and that's, you know, that's not just specific to podcasts. That's in, I think about that. That's one of the biggest gripes in fundraising um, is mm -hmm. the funders, the foundations say mm -hmm. people send us applications. They don't look at what our mission is, who we funded in the past, mm -hmm. what our, you know, it's like they have no interest in us and our goals. It's all about, I need money. I need money. You're our savior. And I'm, I'm yeah. making that a little more, um, cut and dry than it is but i mean it's really thinking are you thinking about you are you thinking about benefiting the person you're pitching and their people whoever those are mm -hmm. would you agree with yeah. that oh my gosh 100 percent. um and i think the shared goals is such a great one because that's ultimately what you want to get through in a pitch is that whatever their mission is whatever their goal is you're providing value to that and um it's, and that's why I can always say like your story and your value, your value oriented speaking points are what you need to get through in a pitch, not your credibility, like <laughs> pitching someone like, oh, I am, you know, two, two times TEDx talker and I wrote a book and I did this, 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 and can I come speak on your show? It's not, I don't know. I, I just don't imagine it's going to cook. A podcast host attention in the same I like way that, that like footnote. Oh, and by the way, right? It was like, hmm. tell me how yeah. you are going to help the people who listen to us. And if you don't yeah, know who those yeah. people are, you haven't done any. You're not paying attention. Absolutely. I, actually, I, I have like a little pitch guide on my website. It's called a hustling writer slash um, podcast pitch template, but it has points, and that's I say, you know, add your credibility, but that's at the end of your pitch that's your bio it's like by the way like <laughs> this is me you know i worked for 15 years and like hr or whatever and i've been featured in these magazines but that's not what you lead a pitch with and that's not what catches someone's attention and it's really that you're digging into something that is addressing a pain point or um yeah like advancing a shared goal or solving a problem for the podcast host audience. Um, and so that I kind of say so you can open up with like an agitating question or an, um, a shocking narrative, you know, like if you're pitching a podcast that addresses um, like 
workplace problems and you opened up with a narrative about how you got fired from work for addressing a sexual harassment um, case. You know, you, you report sexual harassment in HR and two weeks later you're informed that you were fired. That's a shocking narrative and that's a relevant narrative. And then that alludes to the important topics that are going to follow. And then I would say have value-based speaking points of like how listeners can address this if they experience something like this. Um, what are the next steps? How do you kind of, I don't know, whatever, you know, you don't have to speak to everything because I think very specific pitches are better than trying to address every problem out there. <laughs> but I guess so you're talking about kind of repivoting back into the workplace following this or how leaders can address this or whatever it is, but have specific speaking points that cover that topic. But um, yeah, I think just pitching your credibility is not going to cut it. and um, I like to kind of have, yeah, personalize it, men show them that you know their show, um, then lead with kind of narrative or an agitating question that speaks to a shared goal or a pain point, and then have your speaking points, um, succinctly kind of covering the value you're going to be sharing with their audience, and then have a bio and then a call to action. Well, and the other thing you did really well was follow directions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Because I, I did, like, I just immediately I forwarded that on to Summer. I said, I'm leaning towards yes, because there was something, there was, it was at something, mm -hmm. of, I did not know you. I did not mm -hmm. know you mm -hmm. before this, right? We weren't connected on any networks. Um, and I said, there's something about Alice that is just kind of ringing true for me. And I'm leaning yes, I will defer to you, because... Summer is my rational mind too. She'll go, it doesn't fit with anything we're doing. Could we do it? Right. Um, yeah. But towards that end though, I thought, I said, but here's what would be helpful. Right. So she wrote back to you and you said, absolutely, we can do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, it was more relational, um, mm -hmm. but I wanted more. I wanted that mm -hmm. plus this interview we're doing today. And I thought that your approach was easy. And you and like I said, you followed our instructions because we have an onboarding process and you got it done fast. And I thought, OK, that's someone who's going to follow through on her word and deliver because um, I've had people who push and then crickets. It's like, OK, thanks mm -hmm. for thanks for making us jump. So we don't jump so fast anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. Would your um, approaches here that you shared with pitching a podcast, how closely aligned are those? to pitching um, print. Oh my gosh, I love this. I had a conversation with Leslie Seymour on her podcast, Reinvent Yourself, and she is an ex-magazine editor, and like she, she worked like Marie Claire and More Magazine, and um, she was, as she kind of asked me to go through the pitching process, she was like, oh, so it's literally the same as pitching magazines then, it's just podcasts, and I was like, yeah, pretty much. Um, so with magazines, like, the you know different magazines have different styles so i think that's definitely something you have to take into consideration and similar with podcasts if it's like a very serious businessy podcast you're not going to be like hey girl how's it going but if you're pitching like a kind of <laughs> more casual like gossipy podcast that's absolutely the tone you would have you know you want to show the podcast host that you speak to their audience you're not tone deaf yeah <laughs> so i think i think that there is that more it's i think it's, i'd say it's more pronounced in part in publications and maybe it's because i kind of end up pitching a lot of similar podcasts and a lot of my clients pitch similar podcasts so the tone doesn't vary too much whereas in publications it does a lot if you're pitching a personal essay you're obviously making it quite personal um and if you're pitching um you know, the New York Times or Harvard Business Review. It's very factual. You're coming on with a strong thesis. It's your one big idea. Um, lots of research, lots of hyperlinks. Um, and <clears throat> you're not kind of mm, coming in with a bit more casual space. So I'd say that's a big difference. But other than that, with publications, you want to have, you want to hook them in with such a sort of shocking scene or a bold idea or you know something that hasn't been said before and that's kind of your 
infograph, the thing that's going to capture the editor's attention. And as we know, like time, time is our biggest commodity and um, editors get pitched all the time. The more competitive the magazine, the more pitches they get. And so they're not going to read your whole pitch if you don't capture their attention in that opening line. Um, and then where a podcast pitch, you have speaking points and the publication, you would kind of give them or, um, yeah, for print or for online, you would give them a kind of short paragraph explaining your reporting plan. So if you're, you know, say like, I envision a research led feature where I speak to, to C-suite leaders and a psychologist, um, you know, I can bring on board a photographer and I can turn this around in two weeks. Um, they kind of get an idea or, or I will, I will speak to these three points to kind of give them, cause you haven't written the whole article, of course, but you kind of give them like, I'm going to talk about like, you know, and explain in further detail what this is and, um, how it manifests and like how CISO leaders can address this. This is some topic that we don't know. Which is me. <laughs> What's really yeah, clear but... to me, though, is if I'm starting out and I want to understand the nuances of pitching, print or podcast, I actually think you're my gal because for two reasons. <laughs> One, your knowledge, which is great. I mean, that so that's an interesting thing for me. Part of it's your knowledge, but the other mm -hmm. part is relational. It's your accessibility. So I can mm -hmm. say, OK, I don't get it or I'm struggling here and. Mm. or what's it what is my block here like and because you're going to identify is it a rejection block like just put it out there this is solid for now right you've done mm. what is needed you're respectful of the recipient who's going to be figuring mm. this out so i just um want to ask you to talk about what you said you've got that on your website about pitching yourself right can you describe mm. a little bit more about that because we'll make sure that's in the show notes yeah yeah sure um, I have a training for, so so I have a guide for you to use as as you please for free. And that's at my website, hustlingwriters forward slash podcast dash pitch dash template. And it'll be in the show notes. Um, and that's got the template that I use to pitch podcasts. Um, and it's, you know, of course you have to write your own pitch and your own story and everything, but it has the layout. <laughs> and um, then the five tips, such as like, you know, how to make it timely, how to personalize it, um, how to develop a unique story idea. Um, yeah, how to, you know, outline your credibility. And um, then for anyone who's looking for help with pitching, I have a training that teaches you how to pitch yourself to podcasts. And that's um, four to six weeks, they like three hours, and it comes with a 60 minute story development call with me and two rounds of edits um, to get those templates interesting. <laughs> um, and that's called Pitch Your Power. So it's hustling writers forward slash Pitch Your Power. Um, yeah, so that's that's how I can help if anyone <laughs> wants help with pitching um, or setting rejection goals. <laughs> you can email me about that. <laughs> um, but yeah. Well, I think you know it's like in as you talked about those goals, I'm going. There's so many areas in life where we pause because we don't want to hear no. Mm -hmm. You know, and based mm -hmm. on our own personality types. You know, I think some people are more impervious to the no. They they don't mind getting it. It still is not come. They're mm -hmm. not going. Oh, that felt so great. You know, um, but it's like okay, next. And there's some mm -hmm. people who are just going. Oh my God, that that's like in my a, a dagger to my heart, right? So I think our personalities and how we're wired influences it. And understanding like you're thinking about that, Alice, is helpful. But it also applies in a lot of other places, like. What oh, if yes. you don't get the job you asked for? Okay. Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> but you were out in the field putting yourself out there, right? What, mm -hmm. You know, pitching yourself, putting yourself mm -hmm. out. You know, so I think the wisdom that you've shared today has applications in other areas of our life if we look for it, you know? Um, mm -hmm. One of the ways I cope with a no is I think, oh, they think not yet. Okay. <laughs> I just put a T and a Y-E-T after it's like, they said no. Oh, they meant to say not yet. 
<laughs> I'll be back. Thank you very much. Um, or I'll find you the should person. be back. Well, you yes, know. you should be. I remember when I was um, still freelancing as a copywriter and I applied for a copywriting role and they, you know, responded with a very thoughtful rejection and then they said check in. And so I did check in and she said, no, not yet. And then she emailed me like a month later and said, we have an opening. Do you want it? And the only reason she emailed me and said, we have an opening. Do you want it? Is because I checked in. I was top of mind. And so that was literally a not yet. If I didn't, if I took it as, oh no, she doesn't want me, she wouldn't have thought of me when she did have an opening. Um, so I think it applies to everything. Yeah. Yeah. People say check back. They might just be blowing you off, but what if they're not? You know? And exactly. so people, well, how do you know? I'm going, who cares? I'm checking back. You know? So <laughs> they're going to blow me off. It's no, no skin off my nose. It's a call. They blow you off again. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> I know. Took you two minutes. <laughs> but you know, I'm able to say that now because, like you said, you've weathered your rejection, rejections mm. and you can depersonalize them. Mm. Right. It's not always about you. Sometimes it is. Honestly, some people mm. just go, I don't like that person. Okay. Yeah. You know, That's lack of value alignment. You know, you don't want to force a relationship that wasn't supposed to be. You pay for those. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. And not in a good way. Alice, <laughs> you just cracked me up. I so enjoy talking with you. Okay, I want to ask you one last question. What should I have asked you or do you wish I would have asked you today in this interview that I did not and you want to answer? Ooh, that's a good question. Hmm, should have prepared for this. You couldn't have because I just thought of it. How would you prepare for something you didn't know was going to happen? <laughs> um... I mean, there's definitely something. It's no, you know, when you're just completely overthinking and you're like, what is a smart question to ask? <laughs> um, I think really just, I don't know. Um, if you are getting rejected repeatedly and you, you feel like you're kind of putting yourself out there and um, nothing is happening and maybe you've, you've been pitching us all for a few months and you've invested a lot of hours. Is that, do you keep moving or do you take this as a sign to do something differently? And I would say take it as a sign to try new things. Um, so as much as setting rejection goals are great, put yourself out there. You also want to look at the data and if the data says that something's not working, then maybe there's a chance to change your strategy and Ways to do that could be actually reaching out to some people who have rejected you and ask if they have any feedback on your pitch. Um, other ways could be, you know, asking if you know anyone else pitching themselves if they could send and have who have successfully pitched themselves to send examples of their pitches or doing some research. But I think um, like set rejection goals and then also use the data to improve strategy and. Um, yeah, when things work, look at them and be like, what worked here? <laughs> what can I replicate in my future pictures? Be um, curious. Yeah. Be curious. Yes, yeah. I love that. And can I add one more thing? To see, um, because you've mentioned it helping you and I mentioned it helping me. And that is if someone, if you've learned something and someone reaches out to you, take 10 or 15 minutes and say, hey, let me just share this with you. DM or DM me you know, directly, mm -hmm. and I'll be happy. Sometimes it's like, just if you're willing to make the effort to DM, I'm willing to share. If you're not, yeah. oh, well, you know. Oh, well, you try. Oh, well. But, you <laughs> know, when you never know how your little help, or like you're saying, show what worked, right? Yeah. You know, like, and be vulnerable about it. Like, I'm pitching like this, or if you're in a group, like you were in for mm -hmm. writing, it's like, that's a safe place to get some guidance. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, join, find those community groups, um, you know, whether it's entrepreneurs, writers, writers are great people to hang out with if you're pitching yourself, <laughs> um, and ask for advice, ask for feedback, because you will get good feedback, I always have. You've got to extend yourself, that's the main thing. Yeah. <laughs> people don't just come and say, I intuited that you have a question. <laughs> it's like, yeah. you've got to go for it. Alice, I want to thank you so much for being a podcast guest again. Um, this time solo guest, and um, thanks for doing that with uh, our community from Cape Town, and I'm going to say goodbye right now.
Thank you so much. It was so, so great chatting to you, Sarah. Thank you for inviting me back twice. Such an honor. <laughs> I really Bye. enjoyed this. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye-bye. You've been listening to the No Labels, No Limits podcast with best-selling author, change agent, and strategic vision coach, Sarah Box. You can grab the show notes and find out how to work with Sarah at sarahbox.com forward slash no labels, no limits podcast. We'd love this podcast to reach as many people as possible. So please remember to rate, leave a five-star review and share the podcast with someone you think would get value from this conversation. Until next time, keep taking those daily action steps to align your purpose to your principles and achieve your goals in business and life.